until like, three months before the Olympics, he didn't want to swim in the Olympics. He was afraid of it. In fact, when we went to, uh, on the way to Munich, his dad said, sure, I'm pretty sure, and talked to him every 10 seconds. He went to mess with his upstairs. Man, they didn't do that, of course. With the most cool We are, we are immersed in the history, the annals of history of swimming right here at the International Hall of Fame of Swimming here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Bruce, can you take us around and, and show us? I want to see what we got the, the future out there, right? We got the future. Well, now you got to know what, where it came from. Let's see where it came from. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. What we have here, here's the kind of swim costumes that women wore 100 years ago in the United States. Actually, they weren't swim costumes, they're bathing costumes, because when you're wearing these kind of outfits, and skirts and bloomers and stockings underneath, you couldn't swim. That's where they got the word bathing suit. Girls could bathe in them, you couldn't swim in them. This costume here, 1908, a woman by the name of Annette Kellerman invented the unitard, which was a costume that covered women up, but still enabled them to swim. And if you notice the pattern, I mean, it looks exactly like today's laser. How come uh, swimmers these days don't have capes? Well, you know, Gary Hall kind of had a cape, I think, at the, uh, at the one Olympics. A suit that was worn by the world, woman's world high dive record holder, and she dove from 102 feet head first into four and a half feet of water. And lived. More and than lived. one dive. And lived to an old age. Here's a suit here. This was the first two-piece bathing suit worn in public by a woman by the name of Gertrude Ederle. Now, can you imagine a swimmer today swimming some kind of race and getting a ticker tape parade in New York City of two million people turning out? It happened in 1926 when Gertrude Ederle swam the English Channel. Swimming was once a hugely popular sport. It wasn't something confined that you heard about every four years. This is the story of the African-American experience in swimming. Less than 1% of competitive swimmers are African-American. We understand why was that? Well, for the first 50 years of the last century, blacks were entirely excluded from our pools. And the pools were absolutely immense. As you can see here from some of these pools, Palisades Park, Fort Lee, New Jersey, pool bars, Negroes. Eight Negroes arrested trying to get into the Coney Island pool in Cincinnati. These were family playgrounds, but these were also the pools that our Olympic champions and heroes went to. Once blacks were admitted to the pools, the whites stopped going to them. Virtually all of these pools closed down. The only pools that people swam at then were competitive pools. They weren't family playground pools. And that also kept the general population away from swimming as well. Today you have generations of families that take their kids to swim. They become swimmers, and that's the way it's progressed. You're not getting that diversity, you're not getting that new element, you're not getting the Hispanics and the African Americans to come into it because it's been ingrained into the white population culturally for generations when blacks were entirely excluded. So grandpa didn't take them swimming. You know, moms don't know how to swim. 77% of black African American women don't know how to swim. They're not going to take their kids to a pool. You really, you're telling me you never heard of Johnny Weiss Miller or Duke Kahanamoku? I've heard of Tarzan. You've heard of Tarzan? Heard of well, he, there were about eight or nine Tarzans, but there was only one Johnny Weiss Miller. But uh, he became Tarzan because he was one of the world's most famous athletes. That's why he was cast. It wasn't like, you know, people today have no idea that Johnny Weiss Miller was an Olympic champion in swimming, held the world record in the 100 freestyle for 16 years, and absolutely dominated world swimming. And had a dry skin problem, it looks like. You know, kids today don't know who Janet Evans is when they walk in here. Well, if they do, they may have heard that she recently, her record was recently broken. But here we have the costume that she wore when she lit the torch. So, you know, talk about somebody that is a seated a swimmer that's really gotten some great recognition. This is the outfit she wore with Muhammad Ali when she lit the torch in the 1996 Olympic Games. You were, you were probably not cognizant of the Olympics in 1996, am I right? I was two years old in 1996. But our own Benjamin Franklin was possibly, possibly could have been the world's first professional swimming coach when he was in England and uh, as a young man. 
but he chose to uh, come back to the United States and get involved with printing instead. But his first two inventions were the hand paddles that you see here in this comic book of Ben Franklin and swim fins. He decided that they weren't useful because they made, while it made swimming faster, it didn't make it more relaxing or enjoyable, so he discarded them. And here, no one knows this one. Esther Williams, she was the 1939 U.S. National Swimming Champion who was denied her opportunity to swim in the Olympic Games because of World War II. She went on to become one of the greatest Hollywood starlets of all time, and this year, in 2008, she's being recognized by the Smithsonian Institution as one of the ten greatest Hollywood actresses of all time. And all of her films promoted swimming. This is in the 40s and 50s. So when you talk about that 40s, 50s era of being the great age of swimming, you had Johnny Weissmiller being a huge star as Tarzan, you had Esther Williams being one of the greatest starlets, and they swam in every one of their films. Every kid at that point in time wanted to grow up to be a swimmer. What's interesting about the 1939 Aquacade, which starred Johnny Weissmiller and Eleanor Holm, was that it was the greatest attraction at the 1939 World's Fair, and five million people saw the show in one summer. And all of it was, was Johnny and, and Stubby going off diving boards, and Johnny and Ellen are swimming up and down the pool, and then some dance and singing routines that were combined with it. So talk about, you know, the great promotion for swimming. We had, every show had 11,000 people. You know, the great events, the Olympic trials have, you know, about 11,000 people. It happens once every four years. This happened three times a day, every day of the summer of 1939. Five million people saw the greatest stars of swimming swim in a swimming pool. But here's a bust of President John F. Kennedy. Now, I've heard of this guy. I have heard of this You've guy. Heard of this yeah. So you know that if he hadn't been a swimmer, he never would have been president. Exactly. exactly. Because World in World War II, yeah. his PT boat was uh, cut in half by a destroyer, and he had to swim four or five miles and dragged a couple of his shipmates there. But what's interesting about that is his coach at Harvard when he was a freshman was Bob Muir. And Bob Muir was the 1956 Olympic coach. Now, when Jack Kennedy was elected president, Bob Muir must have wrote him a letter of congratulations because here's Kennedy's response. And it kind of goes on to say that your career as a swimming coach might have done a lot for others, but his swimming hasn't improved since he left Harvard. But now that he's been uh, president, he's, he's gotten temporary custody of the White House pool so that if Bob Muir ever came down to Washington, come in and take a dip with classic Kennedy witticism. So you asked me a little bit about how we get exhibits that come in, and there's you know some great stories. The suit that you talked about earlier, the one that you thought Cher might have modeled in, this walked in the door about a month ago with uh, some distant relatives of the woman with a suitcase and said, you know, we don't know what to do with this stuff, here it is. And it turns out that this woman was the world's greatest high dive artist and performance artist who did so much to promote swimming. You know, you, you mentioned about the, co the cape in 1908 that, uh, that, you know, Annette Kellerman, who was the greatest swimmer at the time, wore. Well, it's not too different when you think of what they're trying to do, to draw attention to the robe that Gary Hall wore at the, uh, the 2000 Olympic Games when he was fined for wearing it. He was fined for wearing it? Yeah. That's not an official for trying to make costume, so oh, yeah. you know you have to go out there in the sponsor's outfit. He went out there in that, which wasn't the uh, regulation costume. Worth the fine, I think. We're going, we're going in our library, and it's our library and archive and rare book room, and it's the greatest collection or most significant collection in the world in anything to do related to aquatics. So come on. Okay, now what's significant about this woman, her name was Catherine Rawls. At the 1936 Olympic trials, she won four individual events and the three meter diving championship in the Olympic trials. One of the greatest woman athletes of all time. In the 1930s, she beat out Babe Deirdrickson, who people may know twice for being the world's greatest woman athlete, a swimmer. Now I'm taking you up to the rare book room and to the library area. Back here in the, you know, the rarest of the rare, everything here, and I don't see my white gloves, but I'll keep it in a bag, but this is probably our oldest, uh, our oldest real work of a book. Printed in 1699, this is the book by Thieveno, who wrote the first Art of Swimming, and it was the book that Ben Franklin used, and this, this is probably not Ben's but is a copy of the book that Ben Franklin used to teach himself how to swim. 1699. Fascinating book.
how do the techniques in that book compare to, to techniques today? Are there still similar things, or has everything kind of been adapted by now? They swam in the nude. They floated. Only men swam in those days, not women, because it wasn't deemed uh, respectable. But uh, they swam like animals. You know, they, co they copied... They lost the art of swimming from the ancient days, and they copied the animals. So they swam like frogs, and they swam like dogs. Those were the strokes. Those are still my strokes. They're all here. Steve Clark, an interesting character. Steve Clark took the, the world at the time, 100-yard record from 48, 47, 46. He broke all of the first to break all of those times. And today, our sprinters have no idea who Steve Clark was. No one's ever broken a 100-yard race three Three seconds, at least in modern times. We've outgrown it. You see all these boxes over here. These were virtually every magazine that's been written about swimming in every language is, is here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, about swimming, diving, synchronized swimming, and water polo. But this has, this has the treasures of the U.S. swimming history. Archive. Chlorination. For all time. To archive chlorination. What do you mean by that? You know, we're supposed to have the tablets that were used in the different pools. No, uh, our, the show, the show that we make, uh, we call it chlorination. Oh, okay. Chlorination. Yeah. So, when are you, when are you going to want a copy for the shelves? As soon as you get it to me. All right. As soon as you Sounds get it. good.